Well, good evening again. Technical difficulties on the first try, but it is good to be here with you, and I will get a title typed into the um, title box here shortly. It is good to see all of you tonight, to join in with you all in a time of prayer and the word. Amen. Again, I apologize for the... Um, glitch at the beginning and so I will try to get a title typed in there before we are done tonight amen and while you are coming online I'm going to keep searching to see can I repair this before we get too far into the Bible study tonight amen And at the moment, I do not see it, but um, perhaps one of the admins who are watching tonight, if you're able to edit this while it's live, if not, I will edit it after the fact. Amen. Again, I apologize. Let me get off of that and move on to this midweek Bible class. It is good to be with all of you to join myself with you, the body of Christ, as we come together to the throne of grace and enjoy the time, some time in the word and in the spirit. And so tonight as we get ready to enter in, I'll um, share a few things with you as we wait for a few more people to, to come in with us. This coming weekend is going to be a very special time. Uh, as you know, Bishop and Sister Smith, who I give honor to right now in their absence, um, they are away on vacation, and hopefully they're having a great time. Uh, Justin and Ellington will be joining them shortly, and I'm sure that is going to be a very exciting time. Amen. But this coming weekend, Brother Justin will be with us here at the Rock Church in Clute, 540 South Main. Uh, Brother Justin will be ministering on that Sunday morning, and we are looking forward to that. And so please make your plans to be in the building if you are able to be here and you feel comfortable being in the building. If you want to wear a mask, that would, that's perfectly fine. Anything that would help you to be more comfortable with this, then, then please let us know. and We'll be happy to help in any way we can, but we are inviting you to participate with us in the building on this coming Sunday morning right here at 540 South Main in Clute, Texas at 10 a.m. Amen. And just a few things to keep you abreast of. Normally tonight, this would have been Psalm 91. I believe it would have been verse number three. But uh, as I said, the Smiths are away on vacation and he asked me to teach for him tonight. And so he will be continuing Psalm 91 next week. Wednesday night, one week from tonight. And so tonight I am continuing again the subject on the power of patience and looking forward to sharing this with you all as well. And then again on Sunday night, it will be Facebook Live. Brother Brian Barber will be ministering then. And um, Sister Rosa, Sunday morning will be recorded and then it will be played live or as it would be live at 1 p.m. The service itself will not be live, but it will be recorded and then played at 1 p.m. on that Sunday. That would be central time. And um, if you have any other questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments, and we'll check those after the service tonight. Want to go to the Lord in prayer. I um, have a few prayer requests I would like to share with you tonight. As you know, Sister Barbara Watts has been in the hospital for some time and uh, got an update today, and she is still in the hospital, and she is um, still very weak. And we need to pray for her appetite, pray that God will give her a hunger, a physical hunger to want to eat, to drink, and pray for God to strengthen her mind and her resolve. And so pray for God to intervene with her and then for her family. She has two daughters and 
grandchildren here in the area. So please pray for God to intervene in her life. Again, as always, we pray not according to our will, but according to the will of the Father. Amen. We need to pray for J.R. Shiflett. Um, he is um, at home on hospice care, so we need to continue to pray for him, for God's will to be done, and for the family as they care for him during this time. If you've ever dealt with someone on hospice, then I'm sure you understand what that can be like. So please pray for that family as well. We need to pray for my wife's mother, Sister Hogg, will be going into surgery actually tomorrow morning. It was scheduled for next, for the, um, the 22nd, but they have moved her surgery up and it's going to be in the morning at 8 a.m. So please keep uh, Sister Hogg in your prayers. This is Sister Evans' mother. So please keep her in your prayers. And then last, but certainly not least, let's continue to lift up our senior pastor. He and Sister Smith, Justin and Ellington, their vacation, that they will enjoy their time together. They will enjoy it the, in the best way possible, enjoying the, the fellowship with family, the, the fun, the laughter, the food, everything involved in a good vacation. Would you, would you pray that God will bless them in that regard? They will come home rested, refreshed and renewed physically, mentally, emotionally, that they will take this time of recreation to recreate some fun times, to create some memories that will last for a lifetime. So let's pray that as well. And I'm sure you have other requests as well. If you would like to include them in the comments, that would be fine. I may not be able to read them as you enter them, but please, please include them and we will pray for them. Amen. And uh, Sister Jean's prayer uh, request that she's emailing out once a week now is to pray for those who have been affected by the recent hurricanes, especially Hurricane Laura in Lake Charles, East, deep East Texas, the Lake Charles area and other parts of Louisiana hard hit from Hurricane Laura and now Hurricane Sally going in, into Alabama and parts of Florida. So let's continue to pray for the people who are affected by this because indeed this is the season and this is the peak season of, for hurricane season is September and October. And so we have until November the 30th. I realize God can intervene and knock all those storms in the head that are out there now and send them all back where they came from. But nonetheless, it's hurricane season. And so we pray and we believe we lift up, we lift up the body in Christ, in Christ with Psalm 91, believing for God's protection and covering and God has always been faithful, and we are thankful for that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come boldly, thankfully, to the throne of grace. We come, Lord, with confidence, knowing full well that you are who you say you are. You are the great king, and you are ruler over everything. And Father, in your name we come. We lift up these requests tonight, Father. We lift up J.R. Shiflett. We pray for the family. We pray for Sister Barbara and her family tonight. God, for healing and strength in her body, for the recovery that she needs, the physical, the mental, the emotional strength that she needs. I pray in Jesus' name that she would have a desire and a hunger to eat and drink. God, we lift up tonight um, Sister Hogg, my mother-in-law. We pray for your healing touch in this. God, you see exactly what the surgery involves. And so we pray, O oh Lord, even though he says it's minor, we stand upon your word that even now, Father, before the knife even touches her skin, that you could remove every cancer cell from that spot. We believe this, Father. We've seen you do it before for Sister Barbara, Lord. The doctor said it looked as if she had been scrubbed with Ajax. The esophageal cancer, Lord, was completely removed from her body. We thank you for these things. We trust in the power of your might and the power of your word and the demonstration of your spirit. And God, we are praying now for the manifestation of your presence. Lord, we know that you are everywhere, but it's not your omnipresence we desire. Father, it is your manifest presence wherever we are in this room and wherever your people are tonight watching your manifest presence where they are. And God, we pray that the word of God as it goes forth, that it will, be go it will be ministered in the spirit in which it was given, in which it was written. God, give me words, give me 
Give me eyes, give me ears, give me lips and tongue that will do exactly what you want them to do. And God, give us all ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit would say. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those of you who are just joining in, let me say good evening to you all. Bless you. Uh, it's good to see you. Yes, Sister Julie, good evening. Sister Leveda, good evening to you too. Sister Susie, all of you, thank you for joining in. And for those of you who didn't catch it at the beginning, uh, I had a small glitch at the beginning and I was not able to get the title in there again. So uh, we'll edit this after we are done with the live portion and I will get the title in there. We are continuing tonight, The Power of Patience. And this is part two. So if you would turn with me to the book of Luke. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter number 21. We will begin reading Luke 21, verse number 7. And while you are turning there, um, let me just recap where we ended up on Sunday night. Sunday night, we, our text was Hebrews chapter 10, from 19 to 39, and so we... We talked about that. There were a lot of scriptures in between. I believe most of them are in the comments from Sunday night's live broadcast. You can go back and check those if you would like to review the scriptures. But the very end of it is just where I just want to touch on very briefly just to lay a groundwork from where we were Sunday night. Sunday night we talked about what patience is. We talked about what patience does and the power that it has to work in us as a fruit of the Spirit in producing a resolve and strength within us to hold fast until the coming of the Lord, which is really the whole point. When we were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we were given this power to honor God with our lives. We were given this spirit, this anointing that working within us that produces righteousness in our lives. It produces, it produces, um, gives us wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It gives us all of these attributes and the gifts and everything we need to be successful in our relationship with Jesus Christ including all the way up to the coming of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, I believe it is the Apostle Paul, that's my belief that he wrote the book of Hebrews. But he tells those people, and I'm just going to recap those last few verses just for um, understanding. Verse 35, Hebrews 10, 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, I... Just going to just lay a, a small ground, a little bit of groundwork here. The Hebrew Christians were struggling with persecution. If you were here when Sunday night, then you know that the Hebrew Christians who had believed that Jesus was their Messiah were now being persecuted by those Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Their Messiah would never come on a donkey. Their Messiah would come on a big white horse. And so they rejected Jesus. But there were a group of Jews. There were people, a small number of Jews compared to the nation of Israel that believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And so they believed the gospel and then they obeyed the scriptures. They were filled with the spirit. They were water baptized in Jesus name and they began to walk the way of truth. But at some point in their living for God and in their honoring God with their lives, they began to face persecution, extreme persecution. But one, one, one place uh, the writer says, but he, he couldn't understand why that they were falling away so easily. He says, you haven't yet striven under blood. You haven't shed your own blood yet. So, so what's the big idea? Hold on. You just need patience that after you have done the will of God, you would receive the promise. 
And so this is where we are, and this is where the apostle was writing in Hebrews 10, 35. So we know what, fa- what patience will do for us if we allow the perfect work of patience in our lives. He said, James said, let patience have its perfect work in us that we may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So tonight we're going to go to the book of Luke chapter 21. Now we're going to find out how we get patience. Where does it come from? We know what patience will do. So we're going to begin reading at Luke chapter 21, verse number 7. And they ask him, Jesus Christ, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will be there when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall be there from heaven. But before all these, They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But verse 18. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Verse 19, the last verse. In your patience possess ye your souls. Father, I pray once more. I pray, Lord, for your word, which is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that the power of your word would pierce our hearts giving us the grace, your goodness, giving us the wisdom, giving us, Lord, everything we need to apply these principles to our life for your glory and your glory alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular reading came back around the first part of July. God had been talking to my heart about some things and He began to deal with me about something I will just call transition. He told me that I was in transition. And so as I was praying about these things, he told me and he used that one verse, verse 19, in your patience, possess ye your soul. So I began to dig. I began to research what it is, the the the, what Jesus was saying as Luke recorded those words in his own book. that The word patience, and I'll give you the definition again in the New Testament. This is the definition of patience in the New Testament. It is the characteristics of a man or a woman who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith And godliness. This is having fidelity or having integrity. Someone who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose by even the greatest trials and sufferings. It's someone who is operating in God's kingdom and in his will patiently and steadfastly. It is a patient, steadfast waiting for. A patient enduring. It is sustaining. It is perseverance. 
This word patience is opposed to cowardice. It is opposed to despondency. It is the temper which does not easily succumb under suffering. Now, we, we dealt with this Sunday night in a great deal. And I, this is not going to be quite the same tone of the lesson as it was Sunday night. But there is some very important points that God has given me to share. And so I want to begin by going back to verse number 13. Jesus told them what all was coming. He told them that there would be wars and earthquakes and there would be commotions and there would be all manner of things going on in the world. But he said, and even before all of these things come to pass, they shall lay their hands on you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you up to the synagogues into prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now, some of this is directly pinpointing the disciples at that moment. But some of this is future tense, which is for you and me here in 2020. But verse 13 says, in all of these things, everything he listed up to 13, and then those things that would follow down to 19, he says, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Now, I'm going to give you the definition of the word testimony, but I'm going to also give you the the Greek word that it comes from and where we get an English word that this may not set well with you, but trust me, a testimony is something we all want. The word testimony comes from the Greek word martyrion. From, from, from Thayer's Greek lexicon, the definition is this. It will turn out to you as an opportunity of bearing testimony, of bearing witness concerning me and my cause. That's how Thayer's interpreted Jesus' words in verse 13. Jesus said that all that came before 13... And all that came after 13 would be for a testimony of the kingdom of God. And he alone is glorified in those things. But the word martyrion, if you could see it in front of you, you would know right away. But it's where we get the English word for martyr. I, I told you you wouldn't like the word. But if we were to take a moment and go back and, and look at the lives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and look at, at, at Peter and, and James, um, even James the Lord's brother, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and James the son of Zebedee, and Bartholomew, and the, Matthias, who was chosen to be the disciple in the, in, in, in the stead of Judas Iscariot, who hanged himself, and then... Paul the Apostle, if we were to take a moment and look at their lives, those men had a testimony, and their testimony uh, of their patience in their life lived for Christ, their testimony carried them to their grave. And they died for what they believed in. Now the whole point about this the power of patience is that if we let patience have its perfect work in us, that patience then has the power to sustain me and to keep me. There is a, a verse of scripture that talks about the God of patience. It speaks of Jesus Christ in the same verse and uses the word patience, the patience of Christ. That is the patience that we are going to have to demonstrate and let that fruit be produced in us until it shows up in our lifestyle, until it shows up in our words, until it shows up in our prayer, shows up in our worship. We know what patience will do if we allow it to have its perfect work. 
And I am going to show you where it comes from. But Jesus told his disciples, all of these things are coming. I want you to be ready. I want you to let your faith loose. I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe in my word. Because it will come to pass. And he said, all of these things are going to be for you a testimony of who I am. This is what Jesus said. Then he said, settle it, therefore, in your heart. Settle it in your heart. Not to meditate before what you shall answer. He said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Anybody remember Stephen when he was brought before the council and he stood there. And then when they brought the charges, Stephen then opened his mouth. And for basically the whole Acts chapter seven is Stephen speaking what God was giving him to say at that particular moment. And all the way into the very end, he, be, he spoke the word of the Lord and that became Stephen's testimony. And so what happened at the end of that, Stephen was stoned to death. That was his testimony. So he, Jesus tells him, settle it in your heart. There are a, a couple of places that, that we could go read very quickly. It's in um, um, Psalm 57. Maybe you could just write these down. I will try to include these verses a little bit later. But, but Psalm 57 and then Psalm uh, 108. And I'm sorry, I don't have those directly in front of me at the moment. But the psalmist said, my heart is fixed. It was when he was hiding in the cave from King Saul. Saul was, was coming after him to, to, to try to take his life. So he's hiding in the cave and he's recounting everything that God has done. He's talking about the goodness of God. He's hiding in a cave. But he's recounting God's grace to him and God, God's love to him. And when he got to the end of those things, he said, my heart is fixed. I am settled on this one thing, O oh Lord. You called me to be king. You anointed me to be king. So therefore, O oh Lord, I have one thing to wait for, and that is the day when I will be coronated as king. That's what, that was what he was saying. That's why he could fight Goliath and the lion and the bear, because he had been anointed with the oil to be king. And so therefore, he knew he couldn't die. He knew that the lion couldn't kill him. He knew that the bear couldn't kill him. He knew that Goliath couldn't kill him. So therefore, he knew Saul couldn't kill him. He, he was, we say he was running for his life, but he was running out of respect for Saul because he could have killed Saul on more than a couple of occasions. But David said, my heart is fixed. I, I am settled. I am secure in what you have told me was going to happen with my life. So therefore, my patience that I have, that you have borne in me through much pain and through much suffering. He says, now I am settled on that word and I cannot be moved. So Jesus tells us, settle it in your hearts. Not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. When Stephen stood before the council that day, what could they say? Nothing. Instead, they ran on him. They, they, they fell on him. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They literally gnashed with their natural teeth on Stephen, bit him and beat him, and then carried him out of the city and stoned him to death. They could not resist the words. In fact, I believe that's the, the words of that scripture was they were not able to resist the words by which he spake. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But listen to verse 18. This is I, I, you and I need to hear this word right here. In all of the things that Jesus said were going to come. The things that were going to come against the body of Christ, the, the suffering, the pain, and even death itself. 
the earthquakes, the, the, the pestilences, and everything that Jesus promised. He said, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. Think about it. Yes, in all of those things. What is that saying? It is saying very clearly and very plainly, I see you. Jesus is telling us, I see you right where you are. I see the pain in your life. I see the suffering. I see the fact that you are relying on your patience to survive right now. No, I, I really I don't like that word survive. But maybe that's what some of us are doing. Maybe that's where we are. Some of us are in that particular place that we're just surviving. But let me minister to you right now. Jesus has already promised these things are coming. But he has also promised that we would not lose one hair on our head through that process. He would guard every single one of them. Then he says this, in your patience possess ye your soul. Now why is that so important? Because if those words are true, in your patience possess ye your soul, and they are true then the opposite is also true. What does it mean to possess your soul? It means to, to, to carry your soul into eternity where it is forever sealed in the blood of Jesus. It is forever cared for by, him, by the Lord himself and carried up into glory to, to be forever with the Lord. He says your patience, in your patience, possess your soul. So if that is true, then the opposite is also true. That if I let my eyes, as I spoke on Sunday night, if I let my eyes become focused on the next bad thing that's coming, the next wave of violence or the next killing or, or, or the next uh, earthquake or the next fire or whatever the case may be, if I let my eyes get on that and I say, you know what? I, I can't deal with this any longer. I, I'm, I'm just giving up. I'm going to throw in the proverbial towel. I'm done with this. Guess what? You're in your patience. You can possess your soul. But if you lose your hope in Christ Jesus and you lose your patient waiting for the coming of the son of God, you will lose your soul. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to tell you where it comes from. But we need to lay some groundwork for what patience still is and what it will do for us if we are willing to let patience have its perfect work. Galatians 5.22 speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. And in, I, I can't remember exactly, but it's in, it's in one of the Corinthians. The Apostle Paul writing says that that when the Holy Ghost comes inside, we are we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away and become and all things are become new. Well, we know that that's a process. We know that that's day by day that making us new. I, I don't know about you, but when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, June 15, 1975, I wasn't everything then that I am now. So it is a lifelong process of him making us new. And so therefore, when you bring in all of the other fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness and temperance and meekness and long suffering or patience, when you start bringing those in, th those things, yes, they are fruit of the spirit, but those things do not come to perfection immediately. It is a work. It is a process. And so God allows us to go into different places so that these particular pieces of fruit are then brought to perfection. And since we're talking about patience, let's use this one only right now. James said, and I know I've said it multiple times, that's James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, 4, somewhere in there. James says, let patience have her perfect work in you, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. That, that, that word perfect means mature. It means complete. So it's a process. So how does patience come? 
So let's go to the book of Romans chapter 5. Go to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, beginning at verse number 1. And I would ask you, please, if I stop and comment, please don't read ahead. You'll take away my thunder. All right? So just follow along with me. Therefore, the word therefore automatically tells you it is a continuation of what Paul was speaking of in chapter 4. Can't go there. It's an amazing chapter. You got to go read it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, already a mouthful has been said in verse number 1. Justified by faith. The word justified, this is the way I define justification. It is just as if I never sinned. This is what justification is. When I receive the Holy Ghost, I'm filled with the Spirit, and I'm water baptized in Jesus' name, and I have the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. I have been justified. And in that justification, he stamps me with his seal of righteousness. At that very moment, he declares me to be righteous. So being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word peace, it is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing. So fearing nothing from God and, and content with its earthly lot. That's someone who has peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? Now, keep, keep these words in your mind. Justification. Peace. By whom? Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now, None of these words are without significance. Try your best to keep them in the forefront of your mind, justified by faith, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace. That's supernatural power to do for me what I cannot do for myself. So keep these in mind. Wherein, grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in Hope of the glory of God. Now, again, so important. Every one of these phrases have, have merit and they have meaning for what we're talking about, about patience. And that word glory is a most exalted state. That's where we're going. That word hope in the New Testament Generally speaking, in, in the New Testament, that word hope is referring to the resurrection or the rapture. So he says, we, we have all of these things, the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in these things as we hope for the glory of God. Our hope is in the resurrection and our hope is in that resurrection and what it will bring, the glory of God, a most exalted state. We will be we will have a glorified body just like the Lord Jesus, that glorified, exalted state. Now, verse 3, and not only so, not only those wonderful things in verses 1 and 2, but we glory in tribulations. Stop right there. We what? We glory in tribulation. Now, the, the easiest way for me to describe this is um, I, I shared this with somebody else and just forgive the, the carnal analogy. But that word glory would be glory and tribulations would be like this. The Houston Texans are lined up on the one yard line. It's fourth down. 
there's five seconds on the clock, and they have to go 99 yards for a, t for a score. And if they can score, they will win the Super Bowl. Yeah, I know. Pretty far-fetched, but just give me a second here. So they're, they're lined up on the goal line at the one-yard line. And all they have to do is score one time, and they have to do it in five seconds, no penalties, and they have to go 99 yards. So Deshaun Watson, he takes the snap. He turns around. He hands the ball to the running back who runs like he's going to run up the middle, but instead it, the hole closes, so he bounces off and he spins and he runs around the right end and he finds a seam and he's streaking down the sidelines and all he has is one man to beat and it's that safety, that, that free safety that went way back just expecting that long bomb, but now he, he's, got to, he's got to cut across the field and he's got to try to catch that running back before and not let him score somehow that running back gets past that free safety and now it's a foot race to the end zone that there's no flags on the field the clock has expired it's now it's the game will not stop until he's either tackled or he scores or there's a penalty the stands, now everybody's always already on their feet. And now you, you hear the roar starting to rise from the crowd as they begin to sense a Super Bowl, a Super Bowl victory in Houston. And that, that running back, and, and you know how that, that, that announcer starts to count it down. He's at the 20, the 15, 10, 5, touchdown. And then what? Glory in troop, the word glory means what happens then in that stadium. When, the, when, yes, the roar was up, but when he scored and the referee threw his hands in the air and they looked back down the field and there was not a single yellow rat, a flag on the, on the turf. And he scored the touchdown and they win the Super Bowl. What happens in the stands is an exultation unlike anything that has ever happened in Houston, except maybe when the Rockets won and the Astros. I forgot about those guys. But this is what the Apostle Paul is saying to us in the book of Romans. He says, yes, we're justified by faith. Yeah, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And, and yes, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But he said, and not only that, but we glory in tribulations. I'm asking you, don't read ahead. What does this mean for us? Well, okay, what is tribulations? Well, that's pretty easy, I think, to figure that out. But the definition for tribulations is, is trouble. It's it's straights. It's being squeezed and pressed. It's similar to what they do to grapes and, and olives. For olives to have, to make that olive oil, those, those olives then are put into a press. Used to it was a something that men manually twisted and turned and pushed those stones together and to crush those olives. And they would keep driving those stones together until those olives were completely obliterated and pulverized and all of the the oil that was in those olives was forced out and then caught in basins same thing with grapes as they are pressed out of measure and then in that in that process a a a, a sweet oil is produced and and grape juice or wine comes out of those crushed grapes that's what the word tribulation means it's it's being squeezed it's being Pressed, it's like a it's like a straight where where you are squeezed in, on both sides trying to get through a particular place. He says we glory in that. Glory, we exalt, we rejoice in tribulations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the apostle Paul said, We were pressed out of measure. 
We, we despaired even of life, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But he said, the God of all comfort was there for us. And he prayed for that God of all comfort to go and, and, and support the Corinthian church. That's, and he, he, he talked about that. Read it sometime. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Pressed out of measure. But why? What was God's purpose? He says, we rejoice, we, we exult, we, we celebrate in the end zone the, the winning score. We glory in tribulations also. Yes, we celebrate the, the peace. We celebrate those things. But we celebrate tribulation also. Knowing, knowing, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Huh? Yeah. Let it sink in for a moment. Tribulation works patience. Why is that so important? Because Jesus said it in our text. In your patience, possess your soul. If you don't have patience, then you're going to lose your soul, which is what we talked about Sunday night in Hebrews chapter 10. He, Paul told them, he said, you just have need of patience. Don't, don't apostatize. Don't turn your back and deny the faith. He said, if you deny the faith, I, um, maybe I may have a couple of verses mixed up, but he said, if you deny the faith, it's, you're like an infidel. He, he said, you need patience. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Again, the might is a hinge in the middle of that verse. If you, if you hold on to your patience, then at the end you shall receive the promise. That's the might in the middle. So Jesus says, you want to possess your soul, then you're going to have to have patience. And so Jesus is telling us through the Apostle Paul, you are going to get patience when you are squeezed on every side, pressed out of measure. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are cast down but not, not destroyed. We are, we are battered on every side. We are, we are tested that it would seem almost to our limits. But he said, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then he said, and patience produces experience. Well, what is experience? The word experience is, it's approvedness. It's, in the Amplified Bible, it's called proven character. It's spiritual maturity. In the New Living Translation, it's called strength of character. The expanded Bible, it's tested and proven character. The Passion Translation also uses the phrase, Proven character. I don't know about you, but, but when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, my character was not all there. It wasn't, it wasn't anywhere like it is now. And, and trust me, I'm not where I want to be. And I'm not where Jesus is going to have me just before that he comes again. So our character has to be proven. And so it's proven in the fire. It's, it's proven in circumstances of life. What about Joseph? Remember Joseph? Yes, his life got off to a rocky start as he talked, told his brothers about his dreams and how they would bow down to him. They didn't like it. Maybe he should have kept those dreams to himself. I, I don't know, but he, he, he became not only, not, he, he was the favorite son of Jacob, but it was, the brothers who hated him. But where was Jacob's character proven? In the pit, in the prison, where, which finally took him to the palace. Years passed. Years passed before he made it to the throne in Egypt. 
But in all of those things that he went through, his character was proven. And when he stood before Pharaoh and he and he gave Pharaoh the answer to his dream and the interpretation of that dream and what it meant. And so he said, as Brother Cisco so adequately talked about this past weekend or, or last Friday and Saturday, he said, that Joseph interpreted the dream and the connotation in the story is that Joseph turned his back and he as if to walk away. I'm, I'm, I told you what to do. Now you find a man. And, and Pharaoh said, well, well hold on, hold on. Uh, I, I can't think of anyone better than you. And so Joseph's character was proven, but he had to endure his own brothers denying his own brothers betraying him. He had to endure Potiphar's wife falsely accusing him. And then the baker or the butler forgetting about him in prison for a whole year after the butler was restored to his place until finally he is brought before Pharaoh. And from from the prison, he goes to second in all of Egypt. But he could never ascended to Egypt. He could have never ascended that throne from the pit. He could have never done it from Jacob's home back back in, in, in Canaan. It could have never happened that way. And so whatever ministry, whatever purpose that God has given you and called you to, he has to prepare us. He has to put us in particular situations that are not necessarily comfortable that we don't like it's tribulation it's squeezing it's fiery trials that come against us and in those fiery trials it it either will consume us or crush us or it will cause us to become forth like gold tried in the fire So he says, we glory in tribulation while tribulation works patience and patience brings proven character and that proven character produces hope. And and I know why I I believe I know why They, they, they made hope the last one in those series of attributes. Because hope is that thing. It's like I said, a Sunday night hope goes beyond faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But hope goes beyond that because hope is something that we have seen. We, ha- we know what the hope of the resurrection will bring. We know what awaits us if we, if we have hope in the resurrection. So it's not faith. It goes beyond faith. And again, in Romans 8, we hope for that we see not. If a man If a man can see what he's hoping for, then it's not hope. But we hope for that we see not. And so the Apostle Paul says, tribulation brings patience. Patience produces experience or proven character. And that proven character will produce a hope. And this hope maketh not ashamed. Do you know what that word ashamed means? It means this hope that we have will never disappoint us. But if I can just get my eyes off of the tribulation, I can get my eyes on what that tribulation is doing to me and what it's doing for me. It's producing a character inside of me that will not give up. It's producing a fire inside of my bosom that burns bright day and night. It never wanes. And even when trials come and the winds blow and diagnoses are given, yet that fire continues to blaze inside of me because I have a, I've God's changed my character. He's been working on my character now for 58 years and And here I am today, and now he's given me a hope of the resurrection, a hope that will never disappoint me, never. Why? Why will that hope never disappoint me? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That love has been shed abroad. That means it has been poured out abundantly without measure. Somebody let this creep into your spirit. Let it sink inside of you right now. Love of God. 
Love of God. God loved his creation from the beginning. But when Adam sinned, he loved them enough that he, he would not, yet he would not fellowship them because sin. But yet when he told Adam, you shall surely die. The day you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. Yes, yes, they didn't die of physical death because that was the love of God working at that moment. He was still giving them space. And from that day until now, God has, yes, he has brought judgment on his people throughout the ages. But where we live right now, this period called grace, there is this amazing space uh, that God has given mankind. Yes, yes, uh, the wages of sin is death, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the love of the Father the love of the Father was, was demonstrated to us uh, when, when the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary uh, and she conceived and bore a child. And that child is and was and is the Son of God. Came to be our go-between, between, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus uh, who died for our sins. Yes, the love of God was manifested let this get in your spirit. Love of God is shed abroad, poured out abundantly in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Do you have the spirit? Were you filled at some point in your past? Were you baptized in Jesus name? Did you have the evidence of Speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance? If the answer is yes, then my next question, is it current? Is it still vibrant and alive or, or has it grown cold? The, the love of God never changes. As long as we live in this period called grace, uh, the love of God is still is still amazingly poured out. It's, he's not taking it back. Not yet. But is it current in your life? Or are you praying daily and throughout the day? Or are you, or are you investing time in God and His Word? Or are you, are you allowing the Spirit to work in you and through you? Or are you being a conduit? If, if you can't answer in the affirmative, then it's time to go back and, and revisit the love of God once more and realize it's not him who has changed. The love of God hasn't waned and, and grown cold and gone away. It's you and me who, who, who grows cold in our walk with the Lord. If, if perhaps, if, 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 it's, if it's, this really fits you right now, then and there's trouble in your life and there's and there's turmoil how are you facing it how are you dealing with it or are you are you are the wheels turning in your mind and you're beginning to wonder how can this be why would god allow this or are you looking at it through the lens of the scriptures that tribulation works patience and patience brings experience and experience brings hope. And this hope will never disappoint me because I've got the Holy Ghost vibrant and burning inside of me. Or, or, or is it the flip side? Or are you like the Hebrew Christians in Hebrews chapter 10? What is going on up here? Are you confident in your salvation or are you doubting your salvation? Paul said, the tribulation that's in our lives is for a reason. It's there to produce that substance called patience that will not succumb to the harshest trials and tribulations that could ever come our way. Never. Never. Never will our patience that we have in Christ, it will never disappoint us. If you would, and, and we will probably close 
with a few verses from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I realize the time. I apologize for the length, but just bear with me for a moment. First Peter chapter four. Verse one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Do you see it? For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves, likewise, with the same mind. What mind did he have? Well, Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the son of God. He was God manifest in the flesh when he lived and walked the earth. And so he thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was God in flesh. But he made himself of no, of no reputation. What did Jesus live his life to do? The will of the father. So he, he didn't try to build his own reputation and do his own thing. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, or became obedient to the cross, even unto death, Philippians 2 says. So Peter is telling us, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. The same mind. That mind that says, you know what? I am a child of God. And yes, and yes, I'm going to have to suffer. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to deal with some things in this life as much as I would like it to not be. I'm going to have to. Or we could have that other mind that says, you know what? I don't deserve this. I, I, no, I, I'm, I'm a child of God. I do not deserve to go through this kind of hell on earth. That's not the mind that Jesus had. He could have built his own reputation. He could have decided that I'm doing my own thing. I'm not going to the cross. I'm not doing that. But he never did that. And so Peter is telling us we need to have that same mind. Arm yourselves with it. It's like the word arm would, would be the same as go, going to your gun case and, or, or some kind of weapon case and taking out a weapon and arming yourself. He said, arm yourselves with the same mind. It's a weapon. The mind of Christ is a weapon. The sword of the spirit and praying in the Holy Ghost, those are weapons too. But the mind of Christ, Peter said that the mind of Christ is also a weapon that we arm ourselves with. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. What does it mean? It means that because Jesus did not make himself of no reputation. He suffered in the flesh because he humbled himself to the father. If he would have rebelled and made himself of his own reputation, then he would not have suffered. I need you to get this. Because he Speaking of Jesus that has suffered in, in the flesh, has ceased from sin. I, I know he did not sin, but Peter's making a point that what Jesus did and how that he humbled himself, became obedient to the cross, even unto death. Why? Because he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. What does that mean? It means that if I yield myself wholly and completely to the will of the Father, and I allow patience to have her perfect work in me, I 
am going to suffer. But can I tell you tonight that you have a choice. We have a choice. We can decide. I'm not suffering. I'm, I'm taking myself out of the fight. I'm not putting up with this. If, the, if what Peter said is true, then the opposite is true. That if I cease my suffering, then I began to sin. Because by sinning, I am guaranteed the devil to, for those other things to not come in my life. It'll seem like everything's fine for a while. But it won't be like as a Christian suffering for the kingdom of God. It won't be like that at all. But if I'm willing to let patience have its perfect work, then I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to live by the dictates of the will of the flesh. I'm going to honor God and I'm going to allow him to do in me, through me, for me, what he wants to do. And I'm, I'm going to read quickly. I don't have time to, to talk about each one, but just let me read. For the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wines, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, and this is where I want to end. Beloved, think it not strange. Yes, it may not seem like this is a continuation. But go back and read verses 1, 2, and 3. And then pick up at verse 12. It ties in perfectly. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Think it not strange as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That, so that when his glory shall be revealed when when he comes back so that when he returns for his bride you may be glad also with exceeding joy if you be reproached if they blaspheme your name if they make a spectacle out of you for the name of Christ happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, the people that are doing those things to you, on their part, God is evil spoken of. But on your part, God is glorified when they do that to you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore? Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I, 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 
I, I really need just five more minutes. Because what Peter said in verse 17 and 18 is so poignant. He said, judgment must begin at the house of God. What do you think is happening right now? That's, that's from Ezekiel's vision, chapter 9. I'm not going to recount the vision right now, but let me just tell you what, when that word judgment is used, go read Ezekiel's vision in chapter 8 and 9, I believe. He said, judgment must begin at the house of God. Do you know what that word judgment really means in this passage? The judgment here is the trials. It's the fiery trial, which is to try you. What is God doing with those fiery trials? He's evaluating his church. The point to these verses is concerning Faithfulness. Faithfulness, even in the harshest of circumstances, even in suffering, hardships, tribulation, God expects his people. I'm reading something that God gave me and I wrote it here. God expects his people, the church, to continue their service to him and his kingdom. With suffering, God is judging, evaluating his people, and he will not spare. If there is unfaithfulness, I'm going to read that again. God is judging, evaluating his people, and he will not spare if there is unfaithfulness. Suffering as a Christian is no excuse for unfaithfulness. Patience, long suffering will sustain us through God's grace and favor. As in Ezekiel's vision, judgment began at the temple where faithfulness, faithlessness had led Judah to worship all manner of gods. They had no right to believe that God had forsaken Israel. Listen to this. They had no right to believe that God had forsaken Israel, but was inflicting punishment for past sins. Okay, that's Old Testament. Don't read between the lines here, but listen. God expected his people to follow his commandments regardless of even the greatest sufferings. Hear me right now, because God is faithful to his word. He demands from us faithfulness to his word. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the, the uh, sinner and the ungodly appear? You know what that means? It means for the believer, for the child of God to make heaven their home. There's going to be great difficulty in the process. That word scarcely doesn't mean that we're just going to scarcely slide under the gate at the last second and by the skin of our teeth, by the seat of our pants. No, that's not what it means. It means, child of God, that you and I are going to suffer greatly before the end comes. That's what it means. And without patience, without the grace and the goodness of God at, at work in us, the power of the Spirit producing that powerful, wonderful fruit of patience, we will not make it. That's what it means. And so if this righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? There will be no hope for them. So what is the point to these last two lessons, Sunday night and tonight? The point is this. We know what patience does. We know what it is. And we know where it comes from. But the power of patience has the ability to sustain the believer even unto death. We don't know about all of the New Testament church, what they went through. The, 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 the apostle John was boiled in oil 
He survived the oil. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. And then he finally was brought back from Patmos to be bishop of, of a particular church. He's the only one that died a peaceful death. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and Peter, and James, and the other James, and Bartholomew, and Matthias, they all died violent deaths. Mark was dragged. Uh, one of them was killed with arrows. Peter was crucified upside down. Mark was flayed with a whip and then hung upside down. And then for two days he hung upside down. I believe it was Mark while he preached to his captors. One of the Jameses was led to have his head cut off. And the, the officer that was, that was escorting him to be, uh, to be killed was so overcome with conviction that he confessed his faith in the Lord Jesus and knelt down to be decapitated with James. I don't know that any of us will see that. I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know. But those men went all the way to their death and they never recanted. They never sold out. They never, they never apostatized. They never one time said that this is for the birds. I'm done with this. Church, friend, loved one, I'm preaching tonight, I'm teaching tonight about a principle that has so much power, this power of patience, that it will sustain us until the very end. I don't have the words. I don't have the vocabulary to tell you. Only the scriptures can tell us truthfully and completely how important and how powerful patience is. We're going to be tested. We're going to be pushed. And right now, it's not that bad. But our Father is allowing trials into our lives. He's, he's allowing things to happen to us. He's allowing issues and struggles to come to prove our character so that when we stand like Stephen, and when we stand like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, when we stand like those men, like Stephen, our character will have already been proven. and We will not recant, but we will willingly submit to whatever happens to us because of our patience in what God has wrought in us through his spirit. So would you close your eyes with me and let's pray together. Father, upon the authority of your word, we pray. By the power of the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray believing, God, that this word is true. And yes, I know, Lord, that just us saying it doesn't make it so. But our belief, Lord, is more than just a, a confession of faith, but it is a verb that requires action. So, Lord, I believe, therefore I do. I give myself to application of these words, and I, I, I don't complain when the trials come. I'm not quick to, 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 to fuss at you, oh, Lord. I'm not willing to tell everybody about all of my problems and troubles but I'm willing, O oh Lord, to submit to the process as our bishop has talked about, allowing, O oh God, what is in our lives and what is still yet to come is there not to destroy me, but it is to prove me, to prove my character, to prove, O oh Lord, not to you, but to me and to those around me what is in me, so that, O oh Lord, the hope that comes out of that patience experience and experience hope and that hope will not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out abundantly in our lives and father that's what we pray right now oh love of God so rich and pure 
how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. O oh, love of God, we receive it. We accept what you have given us. God, we receive what you are giving, and we're not receiving what you're not giving. So tonight, Lord, we receive your love. We receive that power and love and sound mind that you have given us. And we bless you and we praise you. And God, I speak over your people tonight. The rest and the refreshing and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Most High to wash over them, to refresh them. And God, to encourage them to stand true. To hold fast to what they know about you. What is written in your word. And God, we bless you. We praise you. We exalt you. We magnify you, O Lord of hosts. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. And God bless you all tonight. It has been so awesome to be with you, to enjoy this time of fellowship in the word and spirit. And again, I give honor to Bishop and Sister Smith. Thank you for the privilege of teaching in your stead tonight. Um, I know it's an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I can't apologize for the length, but I do pray that it was not just fluff, but it was truly what the Spirit would say. Amen. God bless you. See you all Sunday morning if you're able to be in the building, 540 South Main, Clute, Texas. 77531, 10 a.m. Central Time. And again, it, the service will be recorded and then replayed at 1 on Facebook, the TRC United. God bless you all. Let's talk to you very soon. We love you all in Jesus' name. Amen.